Um, but welcome back. It's been a long summer and I'm excited to see you all or see your boxes with your names. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff over the summer between the regional conferences and Grange Revival and um, some of the state sessions, but also um, getting some new, new brochures together. Um, our website, um, specifically our Find a Grange and seeing where we have granges that we know have been closed that are still listed and kind of figuring out where to go from there to keep them in the system, but inactive in case they're reorganized. Um, and obviously gearing up for our national session among many other things. So if you haven't registered for our national session, um, registration is open. We're still taking registrations and about middle of October, um, our room block, and by that I also mean our room discount will get released back to the hotel. So um, if you have not yet decided whether you're coming, um, you still have a little time, but certainly it would be good to to get those reservations in for your hotel. Um, and if something changes in your life, obviously you can cancel up until like a day before, two days before. So, um, but we would love to see you all. So um, tonight I'm excited where we rescheduled this, but we have um, a special guest. We have Jason Davis with us from North Carolina. He is a member there. Um, he is a former FFA educator and he now is a assistant dean at Mount Olive University um, and has a really good perspective um, coming from that, that organizational background that we talk a lot about, uh, the type of people we are looking for in Grange, the passing from the blue jacket to the blue sash, um, mm. because he's obviously worked with uh, folks from, from that area, but also we often talk about the gap that we have in that younger uh, audience and how to get them engaged and involved in Grange and what the, the difference is in, in life today um, for a young person or a, a middle-aged person versus an older person in our Grange membership and how we can kind of understand some of those generational differences in order to, to bridge those, those gaps. So, um, I'm excited to turn this program over to Jason so he can talk a little bit about that and then we can break some of that stuff down and um, do a little bit of interaction here. Um, like I said, this will be available for video. So if you wanna take it back to some of your folks, especially your membership folks or whatever, uh, please do. And it'll be something that I think we'll talk a little more about um, in the coming membership matters You know, over the next couple of months um, to break out these specifically with certain um, suggestions and ideas. So Jason, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, I think I can share my screen. Okay, good deal. Um, let me blow this up so that we can all see it. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Jason Davis. I'm from southeastern North Carolina. So um, as you can tell, I, I do have a, a an accent, and I hope that all of you can understand me. Um, when I have served as the president of the National Council for Ag Education or president of the National Association of Supervisors, which is the state leaders for ag education. Um, I always had a lady from New Jersey and she told me that she couldn't understand a word that I said. And I said, I would always reply, it's because I didn't use any profanity and we would both get a good chuckle out of it. But um, uh -huh. I started my career as a high school ag teacher. So I really go back to those um, much simpler days now as being a high school ag teacher in Southeast North Carolina, a very rural community. Um, after that, I spent 15 years as the state executive secretary. So this is the person who um, manages the FFA in each particular state. And in the state of North Carolina, when I left, that was around a little over 20,000 FFA members and about 580 ag teachers. Um, and I managed contests. Uh, our state convention would have over 3,000 students that were there. And um, livestock judging each year, when I started, it had about 200. When I left, it was um, close to 900 people judging livestock in one day. So um, lots of, of growth there and um, working with state officers. Um, I also farm. I grow sweet corn and watermelons. And, um, and for the last year and a half, really since COVID, I took a change and went to higher ed 
um, administration. And um, higher education, it reminds me of somewhat of like being an ag teacher, but also being an administrator as well. So it's kind of this hybrid of two. Uh, for those of you that do not know anything about Mount Olive, we're about halfway between Raleigh and the ocean. Um, we're a small private liberal arts college that about a little bit more than a quarter of the school is agriculture, which is really odd for a liberal arts private school. Most, most ag programs are at a, um, a land grant university. Um, but I, I'll just jump into this tonight. Um, a lot of times I don't, whether it's a church or any other organization, the million dollar question that a lot of people have is how do we get people involved? And um, there's some different stuff. If we look at generational differences or characteristics amongst these groups, then we can, um, we can look at some ways that maybe there's some synergy there and there's some ways that we can kind of build some, some bridges and some um, build on some strengths. And when we say, what do we mean by generational differences um, or the gaps? Um, these are differences in values and beliefs and um, opinions between generations of people. And these breaks, as we call them, in the different generations, they're not perfect, meaning that there is some blending in between, such as for myself, I fall in between the generation X and the Y. So I'm right there on the edge of that. So sometimes I can identify with the X's and sometimes I identify with the Y's, but sometimes I carry characteristics of both. So there can be some blending in there. Um, but the thing to take away from this is each of these different ge uh, generations that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, um, they're characterized and they're formed by major events that happen during their lifetime. Um, here over the past two or three weeks, you know, we spent a lot of time remembering 9-11. I guarantee probably each of you, if I ask where you were at during 9-11, you can account the exact instance and who you're with and what was going on. Um, and those um, Act, that day and those activities and, and things that surrounded 9-11 changed us as a society. Um, my parents can tell me where they were when Kennedy was assassinated. So, you know, it, it changes from one generation to the next. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the, um, the, the, the great generation or the silent generation, um, the traditionalists. And they were born roughly 1945 or before. Um, they are um, value conservative environments, um, clear chains of command and top-down management. Um, they respect authority and leaders and kind of the characteristics that really define this generation is work hard, save, and press through. And um, I think this will probably really um, define my grandparents. I remember that they were, um, they'd lived through the Great Depression and World War II. Um, so they were very thrifty. Um, they didn't throw anything away, anything to any kind of value, they would, they would save it and hold on to it. And I remember them telling stories about rationing during World War II. Even if you had the money to buy something, you still had to have a, a ration coupon in order to buy something or to get a tire fixed. Um, and typically, they don't talk about unpleasant things. Those are just things that you just um, uh, remain silent about. So some defining characteristics there. Now, if you look at demographics okay. among- well, um, Ms. Peggy, um, Ms. Peggy would, said she would like to get your machine because um, it has a bigger growth and she can cook, you know, do uh, quilt her quilts better. Jimmy and if, Becky, uh, we can, Jimmy and Becky, we can uh, hear you guys. And, and I can't go one So um, I told her, I said, but I have never okay. because I said, from, you mute yourself? Everybody's singing here from the past election. Uh, she won't be here because she's got a granddaughter. Probably down in the left hand corner. So, um, there we go. Perfect. Thank you so um, much. The next generation that we'll, we'll kind of run through are the um, are the baby boomers. And um, the baby boomers from 1946 to roughly about 1964. And, and you kind of got to keep in mind that this was the generation of the hippies. 
Um, the flat hierarchies, they value democratic cultures, very humane values, equal opportunities, um, warm and friendly environments. Um, this is the generation that's beginning to retire from the workforce. Um, they've, they've made their service to society, now they're beginning to um, retire and enjoy that retirement. Um, this is the generation of peace, love, and harmony, um, and also the sexual revolution um, from the 60s. And um, this was also probably a generation that grew up with unprecedented um, abundance and wealth. You know, uh, the American culture at that time probably saw an abundance of, um, of wealth that, that they had never seen before. So people live a, a pretty good life. Um, also, though, the baby boomers has also become kind of a derogatory term amongst um, maybe some um, Generation Y folks. If someone's older and maybe not as, as hip and keen on things, they might say that, oh, boomer this or boomer that. So it's kind of a derogatory term in some circles. Um, also think about the the cultural events that really shape this group. You've got like Woodstock, but you've also got um, Vietnam and the draft. Um, that really shape this generation's identity and how they would look at, at world events. Now, the next group, if we break it down, is the Generation X group. And this is the group from about 1965 to 1976. And some groups, you know, split a little bit different. You might be two or three years off. Um, this is a group that, that grew up, you know, the, the offspring of the baby boomers. Um, so this group really, you know, in, in terms of things, you know, they, they've lived a pretty good life as well. Um, they have positive and fun environments. Um, they like things that are efficient, um, fast paced, flexible, um, informal access to information. Um, because of the Watergate scandal and the resignation, re resignation of, of President Nixon, this group as a whole has a lot of lack of trust in systems. Um, the way I describe it is if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. So they'll kind of black things out or ignore things. Um, they can ignore authority and especially unpleasant experiences. Um, they do tend to adapt, adapt very easily to technology but they can also survive without it. And, and the way I describe this is this is the group of people that probably um, grew up to where they were the TV remote control, that the TV was actually a piece of furniture that was in the living room. And when you got ready to change the channel, they sent the youngest person up to change the channels on the television. This was probably for the, the, the handheld remote. Um, this is also the generation of instant everything, instant coffee, instant dinner. So if you remember Tang, you know, you can still buy this at the grocery stores, the orange powders that, you know, the astronauts drank, you mix it with water and you had instant drink, you had TV dinners that were already made that you put into the oven. Um, and even the microwave, I can remember the first microwave I ever saw, and it's as big as, you know, a piece of furniture. Um, so this is the group that really um, in, incorporate all that and also grew up probably during the early 80s, which was, you know, a time of extravagance. You know, people were, um, became accustomed to credit cards and, you know, they didn't care what it was, just spend it and hit that credit card with it. And um, mass consumption of all different kinds of, um, whether it be brand name foods like Pizza Hut or McDonald's or, you um, uh, radios, um, you know, it, this is, you know, a group that really re live really well. My niece and nephew are just amazed that the, they've got to watch in Stranger Things with their dad, and they just think that the 1980s is just the coolest time ever, and I always tell them, I say, man, it's really overrated. It was not as cool as you make it out to be. Um, the next group is Generation Y. Um, this is the Millennials or Generation Y um, from roughly about the 1980s to about 1995. Um, the early years may share some of the characteristics of Generation X, um, that adaptability to technology, um, to being able to use a cell phone or to use the internet or apps. Um, and I kind of go along with that. You know, I can use a phone, but also I can have periods in which I, I put it down. 
Um, and I like the utility of the phone. I like having a camera on there. I like having a flashlight. Um, I like having apps that tell me things like how much did it rain on my farm today? Or um, if I go to Tractor Supply, I don't have to keep it with coupons because it's on the app. Um, the Generation Y values collaboration. Um, they're very achievement oriented. Um, they tend to be highly creative and positive, diverse and fun, but they require continuous feedback. Um, this is probably the most educated generation to date. There's lots of college degrees and adult, uh, graduate degrees. Um, unfortunately, this group was hit really hard by the recession. The Great Recession um, really hit them hard when they were beginning to start families and buy homes. Um, and also because of college, they tend to be starting families later. You know, whereas the baby boomers may have started families at 18, 19, 20, this group might be waiting until their early 30s or mid 30s. Then you've got the IYs, which are the late millennials. Um, and they're defined by technology and almost overconnection. Um, this is the group that has the iBook, the iPhone, the iChat, the iWatch, iPad, iMovies, iTunes, everything is, is electronic. Um, unfortunately, because of this overindulgence in technology and some overprotection from the parents, there's lots of anxiety, depression, and suicide are just rampant. Um, lots of issues dealing with anxiety and depression um, and the medications that come with that too and counseling. Um, to an extent, the parents have overprotected them, um, yet they feel pressured. Um, this is the group that probably didn't ride a bicycle unless they had a helmet on. Um, this is the group that probably didn't play outside alone because their parents were afraid that, you know, they maybe could disappear or get hurt. Um, they could be really self-absorbed. Um, I think the notation of that is just the selfies, you know, someone taking a selfie of themselves doing something. But yet they can be really generous um, as far as donating to a cause or something which they feel led to. Um, they're social but also isolated if that makes sense. They, they understand how to interact with other people, but they're still longing for that um, intimacy. Um, they love community tolerance and they adopt new ideas very quickly. They're confident and assertive. Um, unfortunately, some do get stuck in adolescence. It's almost like it's, um, it's not cool to, uh, to grow up. They get stuck in the adolescence and being um, young and, and having fun. And um, the phrase I hear quite a bit is YOLO, you only live once. So it's kind of a, a, a opt out to, to do what you feel like you want to do at the moment. The last group is the Gen Z or the Centennials. And this is from about 1996 to the present. Um, this generation was affected greatly by the, the the Great Recession. Um, so they're motivated by security. Um, they tend to be very competitive. Um, they want some independence. They're really good at multitasking. Um, this is the group that probably, if you see them, they're going to have an earbud in, which they're listening to music while they talk to you and do something else. Um, they're really good at entrepreneurial skills with starting their own business. Um, what really amazes me is a lot of the Gen Zs that I talk to, they all want to be social media influencers in which they're paid to uh, market products and broadcast their lives so that they can get paid to do that instead of a, a nine to five job. Um, they want um, to communicate face to face. Um, they've lived their whole life on the internet. They don't know what life is without you know technology, um, but they do tend to, um, to be catered to quite a bit. Um, they're so techy. They have every bit of knowledge that's ever been created at their fingertips, um, but they lack the experience of being able to use that. So they have access to knowledge, but they lack experience in using it. And typically, you know, this is the group that is craving experience. This is not a group that's going to pay for things like a, a Walkman or a VCR or even a microwave. This is the group that's going to pay to go have an experience. Um, so instead of, you know, selling pumpkins, you sell an experience. You come to a farm and you pick a pumpkin and maybe you put it in a trebuchet and you launch it across the yard and you make it into an experience in order to cater to this market. So, you know, if we're pulling all this together, 
um, one of the things that, you know, we think about is how do we get through to the generation Y, I, Y, and Z? Um, first thing is they want to belong um, before they can believe. So um, decision making is not based on logical reason. Typically it's involved on feeling, you know, how they feel or how does it make them feel? Um, they want experience before an explanation. Um, everything has to be experimental, participatory, participatory image rich and connected. Um, they want you to wow them. Um, they want a cause before they want a course, um, and they want a reason to listen. So you're going you're to get a lot of whys. Um, and, and I don't care what your cause is, you're going to say, why is it important? What difference does it make? They want authentic people around them. Um, they want the real you. They don't want um, you to put on ears around them. They want an authentic relationship or the authentic you. Um, typically, they want to play before they pay, meaning they want a, a trial run. Um, a lot of times now, if you look at marketing, uh, before you try, so when you get a subscription, they maybe give you the first month for free, and, and that's where this comes from. Um, they want transformation, um, not a mere touch. When I say that transformational experience, they want change, and their expectations get higher and higher. It's almost like they're, you know, if you go to the circus, each um, act at the circus, it gets more and more intense and anticipation um, rises and you get this sense of urgency. Um, so if you're working with these three groups, you know, be prepared to just over and over again. Um, as, as they change and their interests change, you may have to change your, tactic, um, your tactics a little bit. So the first thing is to communicate and that's via their preferred method. So, you know, I have learned that, you know, depending on which strategic group I would like to target, you know, I have all the social media platforms. So if I want to talk to my mom and, and her friends, I use Facebook. Then if it's my group that I went to college with and some of my friends, they're probably more going to be on Instagram. Um, there's a few folks that are on Twitter. Um, students that are just out of college, maybe they're going to be on Snapchat. And my niece and nephew, their main mode of communication is TikTok. Everything is in a few second videos. And that's really how they, um, I won't say communicate, but that's really where they get a lot of their news and everything at is via TikTok. Um, so you have to find what their preferred method of communication is. Um, is it text messages? Is it emails? Or it may be a combination of all of these. Um, the Department of Agriculture, when they release their blogs, they have a blog. And then they also break it down to where they can share it via all these mediums. Um, recognize your own biases. And we have to look at, you know, where can, where can I be um, more adaptable at? Because of, of my age and where I'm at, there's some things that I just have to understand that I don't know what's cool anymore. And I just have to kind of take it as it is. Um, and I, I'm just upfront about it. I say, look, I, I don't know who the most popular artists are right now. And a lot of these people you're listening to, I probably don't know who they are. Um, and I just go ahead and recognize that. So just be upfront about it. Um, be prepared for hopping in the fact that sometimes the generation Y, I, Y, Gen Z, they will kind of bounce around. And sometimes they'll land and sometimes they might look or, or try to find some other opportunities. They think of um, life as more of a buffet and they're going to pick and choose what they want off of that buffet. And, you know, depending on what their needs are and what they're looking for may depend on what areas that they are attracted to. Um, arrange ways for different generations to meet each other. The unique thing that, Generation IY, um, Generation Z, and even the millennials is that they crave the authentic experiences. And what's old is new again. Things that my mom and my grandparents did are uh, really the new hip in things, such as canning vegetables. You know, that was just something my family did growing up and they still do now. And it's just part of our culture, I guess. We can string beans, um, tomato juice, beets, you, you name it. They, they do all this canning. 
Well, that's the new end thing is people want to learn how to can and preserve vegetables, how to blanch things and even um, cooking classes. And some people have the experience and the knowledge to be able to do that. You know, if they have the ability to share that with other people, that's where you make those connections at. Um, this summer, I taught a whole class on beekeeping to a group of middle school students, and they were just amazed at all the unique aspects of bees and with honey and, and the environmental impact of the bees. Um, so that avoid talking about stereotypes. The millennials really do not like for us to, to kind of stereotype them or to put them into a um, in into a particular type. They they really want to kind of be free free flowing and um, uh, not really fit any type of stereotype um, and use participatory, participative and consensus oriented activities such as what are things that you could do together? Is it uh, a roadside cleanup? Is it building habitat for animals such as duck boxes um, in which you're actively doing things? Um, but that action and that ability to interact with each other really draws people in. Um, it could be something as silly as a, uh, or simple, really, as a chili cook-off. Um, but that participatory aspect of it really draws folks in. So how does this affect your local grange? Um, utilize numerous outreach and communication methods. It takes at least seven points of contact for someone to, um, to really take notice of you. Because if you just send me a text message, you know, I could... I could overlook it. Or if it's an email, it's really easy to delete those. But if I see it in several different um, forms, then, you know, I might begin to take a, make a little bit, well, um, take more notice to it. Um, foster friendships that um, draw on peer affiliation. Um, a lot of times I've seen, especially dealing with youth that are in high school or in college, that um, once you can ever get a couple of the leaders, the rest will follow. So if you can foster those friendships and, and work on um, some of that peer affiliation and pulling in um, a couple of the leaders, then some of the others will follow. Um, provide purpose or make a difference. You know, if it's adopt the highway, that you're making a difference, that you're having that transformational change. Are you fighting hunger in your local community? Are you helping um, uh, folks that, that require um assistance each month you know what is the need that's in your community and then find a way to impact that a lot of our nonprofits, if you look at them the nonprofit world was all started by people that found that issue that they wanted to do something about and they just get a group of volunteers together and say look we're going to make it our mission to fight whatever this issue is and the goal is that eventually um, the organization completes or, or, or ends the problem um, so if you think about it in that aspect, um, offer genuine, authentic experiences that they can't get nowhere else. You know, if you have a, a, a canning class on how to can vegetables or, you know, cooking class or, you know, sewing and knitting, and there's just so many experiences that are kind of left out that, you know, two or three generations don't have a part of. What's old is new again. So you can draw on those experiences um, or a talent that you particularly have. Um, one of the activities that we do at school each spring is we have um, cheer wine and design. Being a, a private Christian university, we, we don't do wine, but we can have cheer wine, which is a soda. It's kind of like a, a Dr. Pepper. It's a local drink. Um, and we offer that experience. So they're able to sip soda and then they paint while they have a engaging activity. And the students just love it. We have... Um, usually everyone shows up for that one event. Offer options, like I said, with that buffet to where maybe if they have a conflict this weekend or maybe um, it's not something that they're really fond about, maybe they can pick up another activity later on. Um, value volunteerism, um, ways to recognize that um, through awards and recognition. Also, you know, just ways that, you know, you show a, an impact in your community. And challenge them with change, um, transformative change. Um, I know that, you know, typically, you know, the, the, the word that we hate in English language is change. But change is everywhere. And if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance a lot less. Um, so we have to change with the times. And also, you know, lean on 
these these um, generation X, Y, Z um, lean on their strengths. They're very tech savvy. And if you're not tech savvy, maybe utilize their experiences um, or their experience in helping you. My brother this past weekend attended an event and his whole engagement piece was they asked him to bring a drone and to videotape aspects of, of their event and to produce a video. And he that's what got him there and his two kids, and they made the video. And it was really nice. But they found something he was interested in. It was a, a service that they really need, and they kind of combined the two. Um, the last thing that I'll leave you with is, you know, if we look at kind of a, a model to look at, years ago, NASCAR um, was not prospering. So they looked at ways that they could – um, appeal to a younger generation that they could market differently and change the, the culture of NASCAR. And they were really successful with it. Um, and they were able to change that. In the late, I don't know, maybe late 80s, um, <laughs> agricultural education in this country, you know, there wasn't as big a need for folks to be engaged in agriculture. And um, there was a reduction in ag programs and teachers and some people got together and they said, now look, this is something we feel strongly about. And we know that having a food supply that is safe and affordable is important to our country and our national security. We would like to strengthen these programs. And they looked at ways that they could update and change the organization so it would be viable for the next 100 years. And out of that, they came out with a, a plan, really about four points of things that they wanted to look at. And one of those was they changed from looking at, you know, your basic agriculture, um, sows, cows, and plows, looking at research and sales and farm business. Um, now we look at the entire food system as part of agriculture. And that wouldn't say necessarily say change, but redirection or growth um, has allowed ag education to not only grow, but to prosper in the 21st century. Um, while those folks go into the agricultural industry, no, there's opportunities for them. Uh, there's more jobs that we can offer, but at the same time, um, it produces informed consumers that will make um, informed decisions um, throughout their lifetime. So, Miss Amanda, um, I guess this is the point which we, um, if there's any questions or um, some areas to um, share. Yeah, I'd like to start with just opening it up for any questions for clarification of anything that Jason talked about. And then I wanna to move to observation. So is there anything that anybody feels like they want clarified? Was everybody taking good notes? <laughs> well, maybe it's just me, but the term IY that you've referred to, I had not heard that generation of folks before. Is that something new in the past year and a half or so that's come around? Um, there's a gentleman that's an author out of Georgia, Tim Elmore, and he used the term IY to draw on the connection between, you know, the, the I technologies, mostly Apple products. And, you know, the Y generation is, is commonly used, and he put the IY in front of it to draw attention to the indulgence in technology and um, electronics. I've so. read a bunch of stuff that's talked a little bit about kind of where they feel like that fits, Joan. And one of the things that was said was, you notice Jason's um, definition of the Y starts in 1977. And you'll hear some people refer to them as late as 1985 even, mostly 80 or 82 are those checkoff points that a lot use. But uh, 1977 was a, also a pretty common checkoff point at one point. And so there's this generation that if you're from 77, you probably aren't um, as tech, as digital native and different things as you are if you were 82 or 85. And so it's almost the way to, to have that bridge for the early versus the late Ys. So think of IY as the late Ys. Well, the time span of all those generations, the one we're in now is 25 years long so far. Um, from 95 till today. So 
are we not coming up with something else? I thought there was Z. Um, what differentiates? Well, the Z, I guess, would be like my grandkids. No, they would be, uh, they were born in 2000. So they're in uh, the millennium. The but um, the group that we're trying to go after that we really hope that we could capture uh, more heavily as Grangers is the, you know, like you were in the F, uh, 4-H and FAA and teaching high school and is that gap that we have as an organization when they leave for college and they start their early married life. And, or, you know, we, we really need to have them stay with us um, through those college years and through their young adults and then continue on. But the challenge in membership is what, how do we continue to have them uh, stay with us, you would have had the same thing if 4-H went on through your college years, which it doesn't, um, how would you influence those high schoolers that you dealt with that are now that you're at the college uh, to continue in agriculture related uh, opportunities, not only hands-on, but legislative and community service. Uh, does your college do things like that? And how can we glean from you some ideas on that? With the university level, um, a lot of your ag programs, there's a couple of different areas. For us, we have um, a collegiate FFA in which the students is a club or organization that um, embodies service. Um, we also have social activities because that's how you kind of get the people in the door. You got to kind of make it fun. You got to do the fun stuff. Um, but they also learn about giving back and engaging and um, being a productive member of society, being a, a citizen. Um, we also have Animal Science Club. Um, Farm Bureau offers um, young farmers and ranchers. Um, and from state to state, that varies a little bit what the young farmers and ranchers are, but it's another um, agricultural based organization that focuses on the legislative part, um, the careers part, the um, engagement piece, um, and the citizenship part. Um, so they have those organizations. A lot of the other schools that have a fraternity life have fraternities and sororities that also um, pick up some of that engagement piece. Um, in short, you know, people are looking a place to be um, involved. They're, they're looking a place that they feel um, a part of, a group of people. And it's up to us to provide those um, opportunities in which um, we can make that productive, because if not, they might find a group of people to associate themselves with in which they're not productive um, or you know, that can get into trouble with. We call them gangs or, or you know, um, other yeah. groups like that, but it's up to us to provide those opportunities. The hard part is somewhere around high school graduation up to about probably, let's say 25, there's that, that gap. And how do you keep people engaged? Um, I don't have a silver bullet for that yet. I know that in college, we, we work with these organizations, provide that social aspect and provide some education. And ultimately for us is to put them into a career, um, a job in which they have gainful employment and can support themselves. Um, but if you can kind of connect the dots um, with Grange to those organizations, um, for us, it's a, a strong agricultural heritage, but I don't think that that has to be um, everything. You know, there's uh, the rule of, uh, Rotary clubs, there are other social um, vehicles that are available that, you know, um, share similar aspects and missions um, that you can, you know, I would say tap into, but be associated with. Um, but I think that really, if you want to get down to it, you know, are you providing value and purpose for your people? Um, in extension, we used to call it voting with your feet, in which um, if you don't find value and purpose to um, where you're at something, people quit going. So in what you're doing, you provide that value and purpose that kind of keeps them coming back. Um, for my local Grange, it's that community engagement, it's seeing my neighbors, um, it's knowing that, that we're doing positive things that matter for my local community. 
And we also do fun stuff. Wayne, I saw that you clicked your mic off. Did you have a question? No, I've had it off. But oh. now, now that you asked, uh, <laughs> his, his last statement about uh, the things that he does, what do you do that your group finds interesting? As far as the college students or, or the local Grange? Both? Um, as, as far as the local Grange and you personally, what what do you find interesting that makes you want to go to a Grange meeting? You know, I'm, I'm also a member of my local lodge, so there's lots of similarities there involved. Um, uh, the founders of the Grange were also, many of them were Freemasons, which were also founded the FFA. So there's all kinds of similarities there. It, it all kind of goes together. Um, typically, we have a, a, a meal or some food. Um, we have an update of community happenings. And, um, you know, it, it depends. We've not had as normal um, a meeting and activities as we've had in the past. But typically they would have some type of a program and people would come and give us a presentation on various topics. Um, it could be um, mental health for people in rural areas. But I, I feel like it's an opportunity for me to kind of grow and build as a, as a person. Um, I, I like to go and learn something from it. Um, the, high, the college students, typically, a lot of times we have to kind of hook them with something that's interesting and fun, such as um, for their meeting coming up here in two weeks, they want to make tie-dyed t-shirts and socks. And, you know, that's the activity to get them in there and, and kind of um, get them doing something. And then we'll kind of sneak in some content there. Um, we also have educational meetings in which we have people talk about different careers. They're interested in that because they want internships and they want to be able to apply for jobs after they graduate. So it's just a kind of, you know, always thinking about what your audience is looking for. And for the students, you know, the officers kind of come up with ideas, but sometimes I might have to plant some seeds with them. And I'll, I'll look around and I read and I study and I say, you know what, that would, that might be something interesting for us to do. So I'm always kind of on the lookout for what the next cool idea is. Tide dyed t-shirts is seventies. What's old is new old again. Is new again. <laughs> um, anybody else have a question so far? Okay, so um, I want to put some, some things in quick perspective. So our traditionalists, which were born 1945 or before, that was that first group, the silent generation that Jason talked about, are approaching 80 years old or older. In Grange terms, the only way of measuring our ages of our members are knowing our junior numbers or knowing so the 13s, the 5 to 13s, 14s, um, and knowing who has a golden sheaf. And one specific way we can track age is knowing if you were golden sheaf exempt. That means you received your golden sheaf, your 50 years of continuous membership before the start of 2001. So doing the math, you could not have joined Grange before 14 which means you couldn't have gotten your 50 years of continuous membership before six, you were 64 and add from that 21 extra years, that is that 85 year mark. We have about 7% of our membership who falls into that category. So at least seven to 10% of our membership is in that traditionalist category. And if we're looking at 96 to present, Again, we don't have really great numbers here, but we know that there's only about 1,100 junior Grangers, which is that five to 14, which means that is just under 2% of our membership, or just around 2% of our membership. We do not have that bell curve, you can tell already from that. And we know looking around our halls, we don't have many of the Ys, I, Ys, and Zs. And honestly, 
we even have a gap in the X's, those people born between 1965 and 1976, which puts them today, if anybody else can do math with me, at between about 42 to, to 55 years old. That's not a, a, the biggest gap, but it should be in theory, the middle of our bell curve. That should be where we have the majority of our members if this looked like an organization that were thriving, but instead we have a slope that goes like this. Traditionalists may be a little lower than baby boomers, but then immediately we start dropping off after that between the X, Y, and I, Ys. So it's important to put that into perspective as to what our membership looks like. What's also important to say is, there's some research that says that you are effective in talking and persuading people who are between 20 and 25% older or younger than you. That sounds like a really weird figure. How do you put ages in percents, right? But if you think about it, um, if you put ages in percent, our 80 year olds are really only effective in convincing people who are 100 or 60 or in that spectrum. Because if you imagine an 80 year old coming to talk to a 16 year old about why Grange is a great place to be, it doesn't feel connected. So the same idea goes with, with kids. If a 14 year old is trying to be convinced, somebody who is just a little bit older and oftentimes not for younger people, younger than them is going to convince them. So 25% greater on that age range, you're going you know, up to 18, 19, 20 years old. After that, there's a disconnect. Um, and, and frankly, in those ages, you also worry about exploitation and things like that. So we know that if we want to capture the Gen Ys and IYs and Zs that Jason talked about, we also need to have the right age group talking to them and their peers but we have to get somebody from that peer group in and committed um, before we can really sell Grange um, in that way. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind as we're talking through some of these generations over the next couple of, of weeks or months, I should say, because I wanna keep coming back to this. I wanna come back to how we can talk to each generation effectively and what we need to make sure our Grange looks like um, in order to, you know, capture attention from each of those generations. Not every Grange may have every generation represented, um, or it may take a while to spread it to every generation in that spectrum. Um, and I think one observation that you guys made, which is this Generation Z right now is super long. It's 25 years. It's a big gap. Realistically, generations don't get defined out very well until you're well past them and into a next generation. So we don't quite know what those differences are because we can't see what the difference is between a five-year-old and a 15-year-old and what the, their values are quite yet because five-year-olds don't really have defined values. So we'll know a little bit better in 10 years where that cutoff is and what some of the features and values are of the whatever generation we're gonna be calling them, the ZZ top generation, whatever it is that we're gonna call the next guys. Um, my best bet, and I don't know about you guys, is going to be, I think a certain definitive line is going to be people who remember life pre-COVID and people who don't. Because masking is going to be with us. A massive debate over personal liberties is going to be with us. And even potentially the, the January 6th, masking all of these things that have to do with politics, personal liberty, civility, et cetera, I think may be a defining line. So I would not be surprised if you see that the next generation is defined about five years prior to COVID. So 2015 would be the start of a new generation um, because you know they're not really gonna, 2016, 2017, they're not really gonna remember a life before COVID, before masking, before questions about personal liberty before issues of civility and conversation really kind of have hit this all time high since civil war. Um, but while we're worried about them for the juniors, I don't think we're as worried about them yet for defining this out. 
Also, if you study a lot of this demographic stuff, ag students skew this data greatly. They do not line up with what we shared tonight. They mimic that of their grandparents. It's really extremely conservative and traditional. Um, they might have a little bit of the technology, but they really skew this way out of, they don't line up with this evenly. Um, they, they really skew the data. So as you make your decisions, if you're in a rural um, area, um, you, you may want to take that into consideration. You were reading my notes, weren't you? No, that's, <laughs> I, I should have put it in mine, but it was, it was not scribbled on my notes here for this evening. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Wayne. I, I think the, the one thing that, that he touched on there uh, has been going on in rural America ever since pre-depression. People in rural America always look out for each other, take care of each other. And as I've said many times, if, if you go to any place in America where there's farmers, they will be the last ones to ask for help, but they will be the first ones there to offer help. And kids mimic what they see. And when they see their parents and their grandparents working their butts off to give them a better life and they understand getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going to the barn to, to feed their animals before they go to school those values are instilled in them for the rest of their lives uh, at first they don't always appreciate it but when they get to college age and they look back they start to realize that's what has defined them so I, I really see it as rural and urban America and the cities. It's two entirely different environments. And I think that's where Grange offers people in the cities what they've been missing, that family values. Um, one of the things that were, was on my notes about this idea of how our rural populations or our, our ag-related populations are going to look different than what was presented um, is that you're, you are certainly going to have some more of that um, volunteerism and the social values across the board, no matter what the generation is. But don't think that you toss everything out because for example, your generation Z who's rural are still extraordinarily great multitaskers. They're still listening to the podcast while they're in the barn. Um, they're still, you know, listening to the radio while they're doing homework and, you know, chatting with friends or, or creating a TikTok. They still are competitive. Um, they still are extraordinarily entrepreneurial. So some of the things that um, were included in the, the profiles of these um, don't change. They go exactly with exa what Jason was talking about because of the world in general around them, um, but also the things that are available to them. Um, when credit cards were not even a thing that were, was available, you could not live beyond your means. So there's an entire generation of traditionalists who, who cannot quite come to grips with the idea of living beyond what's in the bank, right? Um, no matter how many years credit cards have been available to them in their adulthood, their formative and primary memories and experiences and the value shape there, you know, don't have them in that mindset. Similarly, um, the Generation Z who has technology at their fingertips with very few exceptions, I know we do have rural populations without broadband and stuff like that, but with very few exceptions, there isn't someone in the you know, born during 1996 and after generation that isn't geared in their mind to knowing that they can answer a question that's just been asked quickly, that there's immediacy um, and that the responsiveness of an organization that they're in, um, of, of a, a device that they're working on or something like that is immediate. And so there is expectation of immediacy. So for example, our process of bringing a new member in, we've talked a lot in the past about 
you have an application, you go to a meeting, you are voted on. And in, in old Grange world, in traditional Grange world, you have to go through the degrees before you are actually a full functioning member. We have pretty much for the most part in almost every Grange now come at least to the welcoming ceremony, but they are used to a technology where they can apply and get accepted and hear about it within five minutes or less on their phone. And so our process doesn't match the same, you know, expectations that they have that the world around them has set. Um, that's not to say that we need to change our process right now, but that is to say we have to understand where these generational markers um, certainly do impact the way in which people come to interact with Grange. And these are first impressions oftentimes. Um, Jason, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about one other thing. We, we did mention there that Gen X should be our, our middle ground. That should be our highest number of members. Um, it's not from anything that we can tell observationally going into Granges. And so one of the things that you talked about was, um, you know, they are the start of the generation who really um, has an orientation towards diversity, um, openness, inclusion, respect, et cetera. Um, and some of the things that that we build within our system sometimes compete against that. Um, can you talk, I think, for a minute about where these generations might find some barriers to entry, either with their value systems or with our structure um, that you thought about as you were putting together some of this presentation? Wow, that's, that's a really intense question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to, to wrap my mind, you know, just come in here and, and wrap my mind around where that would be. Um, you, you know, the baby boomers were kind of, you know, want everyone to be the same and same opportunities. Um, I don't really know that Generation um, Y or IY or Gen Z, um, they've grown up in a much more inclusive environment and um, they don't want to exclude anyone so you know as you look at that um, I find myself being very um, selective in maybe some of the verbiage and stuff that I use um, I'm, I'm not as as um, as versed as you know I, I don't put my pronouns in my email and stuff but you know we have to be um, cognitive of that if if those are you know, someone, you know, we can't assume any of that. Um, and, and to use language that we think is inclusive to attract all individuals, um, and especially with all these groups, because that's going to be something that's going to be kind of one of their litmus tests. Um, they don't want to be exclusive. They want to be very inclusive to all groups um, because they, you know, they've grown up in a, a much more um, open and diverse society, especially if they are in suburban or urban areas. Um, I think maybe in rural areas, it might be a little bit more um, subdued, but especially in the suburban areas. Um, yeah, I would, I don't know if there's any practices per se that I've seen, um, but my experience is limited to my local grange. Um, we have several, two or three granges around us. Um, and it is kind of unique that as you change grange, the clientele of those people that make it the majority of those granges change. Um, our neighboring sister grange is um, probably about, I'd say 50% minority um, because of some of the leadership is in there. Typically we find it you know, with, with teachers that people recruit people that are like them. So for me, it would be real easy to recruit white males. Um, for you, it might be white females. And if you were a minority, you may attract folks um, that have similar characteristics to you. So um, that's kind of a roundabout way. Honestly, that question, you could write a thesis about it. It is <laughs> very um, in-depth. And I, I think there's probably a lot more that needs to be fleshed out of that. What other questions or observations do you guys have? And I know that this is something that you're kind of balancing as you're 
reorganizing two, two granges in your state. And we've talked a little bit about how to talk to some of the younger folks um, about Grange and its, its situation within their lives when they have not had it there before. Anything that struck you from his presentation? Yeah, this is really uh, actually quite valuable uh, because I'm looking at um, working in Granges in two very different uh, areas. One of them is very much an, uh, an affluent urban suburban area where we're probably going to we're working on attracting those Gen Y, I, Y, and Zs definitely. So <clears throat> um, that profile is really valuable and trying to figure out what kind of a, what kind of information we want to present. Uh, the other one is definitely in a more rural area um, in Minnesota. That will definitely be pro probably that Gen X. Uh, group. <clears throat> so this is really valuable um, um, to figure out, you know, the kinds of questions that we want to ask as people, as we, as we present information, we're going to have, um, uh, we've got plans out for like sort of an orientation informational gathering or space. And like, what are the things that we want to present to them? And the conversation, or actually, it's more like the questions that we want to ask people that walk by, I think, rather than here we are, and this is what we can do for you. It's more like the questions that we can ask them about what is needed in their community and how would they like to participate. Um, so this is really useful to help um, define the questions that we might want to ask those, those people in those different areas. I think that's a good thing to yeah, know because yeah. you talked about, you know, what questions to ask them. People are going to come to Grange with different primary functions. Some people are going to come yeah. because they need an extended family, whereas others are going, going to come because they want experiences, and yet others are going to come because you're doing something that is personal to them. You're making a difference in a specific area, um, not like physical, geographical, but maybe your Grange is raising a lot of money for FFA and getting the, the jackets for the kids. And so they were an FFA student who had trouble affording their jacket. And so that's a personal mission for them. So um, your Grange may have its primary function. Um, it, the people in your Grange may find they're there for different primary reasons, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting to. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but um, knowing what it is that your Grange is tickling in their lives, what, what needs you are meeting um, also tells you what type of things are going to keep them centered there. If all you're working on is the jackets for the FFA members and you don't stoke the family aspect by having, for example, meals together or opportunities to go camping together or bowling together or, or things like that, you'll lose a part of the group because they were there for the family environment. Whereas if you stop doing some of the service in a really specific area that's of interest to someone, because maybe you've refocused on something else um, or you finally met that need and the need is no longer there, you may lose other people. Um, that doesn't mean that you've done a bad thing. I think Jason did a really good job of mentioning the fact that most of the younger Y, I, Y, and Zs are hoppers. Um, we're not going to see a lot of 50-year members out of these generations. They're going to either come to Grange late oftentimes because, frankly, we don't have a lot of young people in Grange right now. Um, and so at 35 when they find Grange, they're gonna to have to be 85 before they, they get that certificate, um, which I guess wouldn't be that old at that point. We're all getting, uh, living longer, but um, it does mean that there's gonna be fewer of them just by virtue of the 50 year mark, but also because they hop in and out of things. Um, they may leave you during college because there's fraternities and there's you know, alumni clubs and their social groups on campus that fill the need that you were meeting, um, but they may come home to you at some point, or they may hop out for a few years because you're not meeting the specific need that they wanted. 
the hope of course is that you figured out what need they you were meeting then and what needs they have later on in life and you're they're hopping back in um but the other part, I guess, is not to be as concerned anymore in some ways about always meeting just the needs of the people who are in the room. Because by virtue of, of our society today, by virtue of some of these characteristics, that you weren't going to keep them there all the time anyway. So deciding to never change in order to meet new needs in your community or to do things that your current membership you know, maybe pulling towards or whatever, um, just because you want to keep everybody is almost like saying, um, you know, everybody's going to become 100%, every single person in the country is going to become 100% literate by a certain date. It just can't happen. You're setting yourself up for failure, right? Um, so, so I think that that's a really good point as well, is, is some of the characteristic of hopping and of, you know, attaching differently at different times of life to different organizations. Uh, Amanda, sometimes it's just real simple things. I was, my family had no relation to Grange. My grandparents were sharecroppers on both sides. And I was a high school ag teacher and some folks I went to church with that I kind of, college didn't have anything to do with church. I started teaching. I started going to change churches and denominations and all that stuff. And some folks I went to church with said, hey, we got a Grange meeting what if some of your students came and said the creed for us tonight? So I took a couple of students one time on a whim, said, we'll go to the Grange and see what's going on. And they said the creed. And one of those kids that I brought, he ended up being the state chaplain. Um, so there was a group of five about. or six. So, you know, the return on that investment, you know, those students were all engaged and are still engaged to this point because of you know, a meeting to ask them to come and to um, to bring some plants or, you know, maybe it's the 4-H club that you come and they talk to you about, I don't know, whatever it is that their livestock that they're showing or a project, service project they're working on. If it's your Eagle Scouts, come just tell us about your, your Eagle Scout project. I, I think that there's all manner of different layers of youth engagement that um, you can rely on. And don't think that because you do something one time that's going to solve it. It's kind of like bathing. It doesn't last long, but that doesn't mean we stop doing it. We have to continually kind of uh, uh, keep applying the same amount of um, interest and passion and, and work to it, just like you do bathing. Um, so I, I would leave you with that, you know, just little small things like, you know, um, making a relationship with with your local ag teacher, your extension agent, maybe it's the Boy Scout troop that you provide them with a place to meet. Um, if you have a, you know, we're lucky, we have a, a, our own building that we own um, to meet in. But, you know, those relationships can lead um, into other things for you. So I wanna ask, I know it's 942, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap in just a few minutes. I'm gonna ask if anybody else has any questions before Jason leaves us tonight. I'm hoping that as we work through some of these generational things in the next couple of months, he'll come back and visit us um, and, and sit as our resident expert, but he may not um, be prepared with a presentation like this. So while it's fresh on his mind, please ask him any questions you might have. Um, at the end of my slideshow, I left the reference for one of the texts that I used to kind of pull some information from tonight. Um, I think it's Generation IY is the text that I use, um, but you can order it probably through Amazon or through the website if you do a Google search. Um, it's out there, but it's a really good reference to pull from and to kind of um, wrap your mind around where some of these generations are at and how we can effectively meet the um, demands of, of their needs and also what our needs are as well. So, um Thank you, because I think that this was really helpful and it's also a really good setup for the next couple of, of meetings. Uh, you all will probably understand why I'm going to say we're not going to have a meeting in November um, because we will be at national session or coming back from it. I think I'll be back on the road from it. Um, next month, I want to do a meeting about um, having benefits, local benefits at your local range. So we're going to take a pause 
Um, I did not plan that as well as I expected. And then starting in December, I want to start looking at these generational things and how we have very specific examples of what has um, attracted and kept people um, from certain generations. Obviously, the traditionalist generation, I'm going to probably spend less time on, not because we don't love our 85-year-olds, but because the return on investment for getting new 85-year-olds in is smaller than if we get people from some of the, the newer uh, generations. So I'm going to combine the traditionalists and the baby boomers um, because as baby boomers are starting to retire um, and, you know, really freeing up some time, there is some, some value that they can find in Grange. Um, so we'll start doing that in December. But uh, in the meantime, I just wanted to leave you with one thing, and that is, um, I loved your quote, Jason, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance a lot less. And it reminded me of a part of our ritual, which talks about um, nature never going backwards. And um, change is inevitable. I mean, that is part of some of the things that you can read straight throughout our manual and in our degree work and things. Um, so so part of what probably we're going to discuss is some change stuff. And I think I'm going to probably keep bringing that up. If you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance a lot less. So um, hopefully next month when we talk about the local benefits, it'll be a little bit easier because uh, it'll be le less change topics. But then after that, we'll, we'll be coming back on some of that. So, um, so quickly, have, Amanda, uh, yeah. Jason referenced, uh, 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 he, he commented on a reference. Oh, the text? Um, yeah, can you like send a I link? Gonna, I was going to actually ask Jason to give me the PowerPoint slide to include um, with the link that we send oh, out. Oh, perfect, perfect. Cool. That'd be great. That'd be fun. I'd like to look at that. Yeah. So yeah. super. Thank you. Uh, Etmore, Generation IY, our last chance to save the future. And yeah. is it scary to you, Jason, that that was written like 11 years ago now? You, you know, I, I'm beginning to show my age a little bit, but um, <laughs> he might need to he might need to come up with, with a um a updated text. <laughs> so strange. I feel like that was not that long ago. No, it's um slipping away from us. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll get the slide presentation to send out as well as this video. Um, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks in October. Um, for the third Tuesday, which I'm going to give you the date, should be the 19th. Um, and then, like I said, I'll see you at convention in November. Um, and then we'll be back here talking about generational stuff in December. So just a, a preview of what's coming up. Um, Jason will have his contact information on those slides. So if you need any references to anything um, dealing with generational stuff, he is our resident expert. Um, and if you need anything specific, um, feel free to stay on here after we're done and I can answer some questions. I know, Anne, you were on that list. So thank you guys all for coming with us today on this fun journey. Thanks. Thank you, Jason, for joining us. We're glad you're a Granger. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>